our Southern Baptist Convention through the North American Mission Board has made this an emphasis for a while now. Who's your one? We've taken that, kind of modified it, and applied it to our congregation in this idea of everyone matters. And, and I want us to begin the year together showing you some simple ways to share your faith, to bring a person into a relationship with Christ. This morning, I want to talk about what's called the four spiritual laws. When you came in, you should have received some paper that you can use to kind of fill in some blanks so that you have an outline that you can use and study and take a few things away from this. But I want to show you this morning an outline called the four spiritual laws. There is a company that's been around for over 100 years that's called uh, Underwriters Laboratories. And you may not have ever heard of this company, but I promise you, you've seen it. How many of you have seen this logo? Just, it's a little UL that's on everything from your Christmas lights to your vacuum cleaner to your blender to your light bulbs. Even if you look at a life jacket and you look inside that life jacket, you see the UL logo right there. And what UL does, they've made it their mission to make the world a safer place. And so they've created laboratories and safety standards that you can submit almost any product to, and they will test them for you to make sure that those products are safe products for use. And so did you know, though, that Underwriters Laboratories has a series of training classes about life jackets. There's kind of this 101 level that's, here's how you put a life jacket on. This is how you make sure that when you're boating one day, you're safe. That's the same thing your uncle told you that when he, before he took you out on the boat. There's a 201 class. It goes through all the codes and different applications of standards for life jackets. There's a 301 class. It talks about all the materials that are used to make a life jacket. And then the 401 is a series of seven sessions that talks about the engineering and designs that are used in flotation devices and how those things are applied in different water situations. You can spend thousands of dollars and countless hours learning about life jackets at underwriters' laboratories. But let me ask you this. If you were out on the lake one day, and you were out on a boat, and someone fell out of the boat, would you stand there and lecture them on safety codes and the designs of a life jacket, or would you throw them something that might save their life, right? I I think everybody in here would say, man, I'd throw them a life jacket. I'd throw them a flotation device. I'd do whatever I could to, to make them safe. And then... If you wanted to be the most boring person that's ever been on a pontoon boat, you could spend hours and hours telling them how that life jacket was made. I mean, that's, you know, that's obvious. If you want to save someone's life, you do the simplest thing and the most effective thing you can possibly do. So I want to let you know today's message and the next three weeks are life jacket sermons. They are the simple explanations of the gospel. And what I'm wanting to do is hand out life jackets so that you can take that life jacket and you can put it on someone else who realizes they are in danger and something needs to change. They need to be saved. These are great ways, simple ways, for you to share your faith. These are not going to be apologetic-based sermons that are going to answer the questions of your atheist friends. You will not leave here in four weeks knowing the deep, dark answers to the question, did Adam have a belly button? Or what does predestination mean? We're we're not going to get into all that kind of stuff, right? This is just life jacket stuff. And the four spiritual laws were developed by a guy named Bill Bright back in the 50s. And you may not have known who Bill Bright is, that you've probably heard of Campus Crusade for Christ. And so what he did is he developed a little pamphlet. And you can go online, you can buy these pamphlets even today. If you look at our deeper dive on our app or on our website, I give you a link where you can go and read the pamphlet for yourself. But we've provided that outline so that you can have it in your hand 
And, and that, that it's designed for you to walk somebody through just four real simple uh, statements about our faith. And so let's go through them together. Now, I want you to understand this before we get into this about the four spiritual laws. The four spiritual laws is something good to share with somebody who is spiritual, but maybe aimless. They're spiritual, but undefined. Maybe they believe in God, but that's about it. Something else about the four spiritual laws is this is jumping off the, the diving board. I mean, you're just you're going straight into the pool. A couple of things I'm going to show you over the next couple of weeks will give you some transition questions, some conversational things about how you might turn any kind of conversation into a spiritual conversation. This is just, we're jumping in. So law number one is this. God loves you and has a wonderful plan for your life. God loves you and has a wonderful plan for your life. Let's break that down. First of all, it says... God loves you. The Bible says in John 3, 16, For God so loved the world, He gave His only begotten Son, that whoever believes in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And I want to tell you, it is great news that we have a God. But it's even better news that we have a God who loves. And it's even better news that we have a God who loves, but He loves you. And it's one of the most simple statements of our faith, but I think in these loveless days, it's one of the most refreshing things that we could share with any person. Just simply to tell them, hey, God loves you. The great evangelist Billy Graham, who spoke to millions of people and his broadcaster still shown on a weekly basis, was a master at sharing the gospel. And I read an interesting story about Dr. Graham this week. They said he would walk into these huge stadiums or these venues where he was about to, about to talk to millions and thousands of millions of people over the course of a few days, and this broadcast would go over all the world. And he would walk into these venues while they were still empty for a sound check. And there would only be a few people there for the technicians and all the different things to, to make sure that they were ready to go. And he would do the same thing every single time he did a sound check. This is what he would do. He would quote John 3.16 every time. And someone finally asked him, they said, Dr. Graham, I've been working for you for 26 years, and I've noticed that every time you do a sound check, you quote John 3.16. Why do you do that? And this is what he said. He said, if the lights never come on, if none of the cameras work, if there's never a broadcast and not a single person comes into the stadium, he says at least the sound man knows this. God loves him. He needs to hear that. And I think that needs to be our heart, that we need to be telling people, God loves you. Let me encourage you to do this this week. I want to encourage you to throw out a simple life jacket at some people you know. And just tell them God loves them. It may be somebody checking you out at the grocery store. It may be one of your friends. Hey, listen, it may be your husband. It may be your wife. It may be your kids. If they're giving you a fit, there's nothing better to break them down than tell them God loves them, right? <laughs> I don't know who it is, but just tell somebody. This week, God loves you. If you're scared to tell people God loves you, holler it at the guy across the street and make a run for it. Whatever you got to do. I just want to encourage you to tell somebody, throw them a life jacket, that God loves them. The, the, the law, number one, says not only does God love us, that He has a wonderful plan for our lives. John 10.10. 10. Let's talk about God's plan. John 10.10 10 says this, I have come that they may have life and have it more abundantly. That word abundant means life in the full. The life that you were always meant to live. And I think one of the things that people are lacking in our culture right now is not only love, but a lot of people are lacking purpose. Why am I here? Why, why am I on this planet? What am I supposed to be doing with my life? And did you know that 84% of young adults understand that one of the keys to my happiness is knowing the purpose of my life? Young adults realize, man, i got to have some purpose to connect myself to to 
to not just coast, not just survive, but I want to do something with myself. And even though 84% of young adults understand that happiness is connected to a purpose for your life, only 30% of young adults actually know what their purpose is. And when you don't know your purpose, it leaves you hopeless. People need to hear. They have a God who loves them. He has a purpose and a plan for their life. And that word abundant means when you receive Christ, you become the kind of person God has always created you to be. And so the next question that gets us into the second law is this. Why is it that most people don't live an abundant life? So law number two is this. Man is sinful and separated from God. Therefore, he cannot know and experience God's love and plan for his life. Let me read that to you again. Man is sinful and separated from God. Therefore, he cannot know and experience God's love and plan for his life. Now, let's break that statement down. First of all, that statement says man is sinful. What does it mean that man is sinful? I, the Bible says in Romans 3.23, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And then I want to read to you a statement that's on that little four spiritual laws pamphlet. And it says this as an explanation of sin. Man was created to have fellowship with God. But because of his own stubborn self-will, he chose to go his own independent way and fellowship with God was broken. This self-will characterized by an attitude of active rebellion or passive indifference is an evidence of what the Bible calls sin. Let's talk about those two things, active rebellion or passive indifference. Active rebellion is what we see people do who are walking headlong, trying every way to destroy their life. They seek satisfaction and, and, and pleasure in a lot of different things, whether it's, it's sexual things, whether it's money, whether it's, it's recreation, whether it's sports, whether it's power, whether it's business. Whatever it is, we're seeking so hard for satisfaction, and when we can't find it, we just go one more time trying to dull the pain and find a way in our life to just feel good about anything. That is active rebellion. Number two, though, passive indifference is this idea of, I just don't care. I don't really think about God. I don't, I don't really consider those things. Those things are not forefront in my mind. I am apathetic. And I think one of the things that we see in our day and age is an incredible amount of distraction. People really aren't thinking about eternal things. We're, we're thinking about our opinion. We're thinking about this week, how do we fix our country? We're thinking this week about, about telling everybody what we think on Facebook and all those sorts of things. But here's the thing. At the end of the day, the one thing that really matters is, are they going to spend eternity with Jesus Christ? That is the most important thing. C.S. Lewis wrote a litany of books that have influenced our, our, culture, our Christian culture. But one of my favorites that he wrote is a book called The Screwtape Letters. And The Screwtape Letters is a brilliant conversation that he put together between a master demon and his apprentice called Wormwood. And he's trying to teach him how to tempt this person and turn him away from God. And the young apprentice demon wants to scare him. He wants to show him that there's demons and that there's, there's all these evil things in the world. And, and Wormwood tells him, he says, it, that's not the way to turn his heart away from the Lord. He said, because the most effective way to turn someone away from the Lord is with a gentle downward slope where there's no signposts, there's no warning signs, there's no, not even anything to let them know they're going the wrong way. And I think that's exactly where we are as a culture. We're passively indifferent about that. We're so charged up about what's going on that we see on the news that we forget what really matters is our relationship with the Lord and whether or not a person who is created by God as an eternal soul knows Jesus. And so we're in rebellion against God. And the next thing is this, man is separated from God. Romans 6.23 says this, The wages of sin is death. 
And that death is not just a physical death, as in you stop breathing. But that death is an eternal death in which we are forever separated from God. And as horrible as hell is with the flames and the fury and the pain, the most horrible thing about hell is that you will forever be separated from God and have no hope. And so Romans 6.23 says the wage of sin is death. Uh, the wage of sin is death. And in that pamphlet and on the sheet that I gave you, there's a little diagram. And this is effective to show a person the separation. God has created us and He loves us. But we don't experience that because of sin. And so that brings us to the question, what is the solution? Law number three. Law number three says Jesus Christ is God's only provision for our sin. Through Jesus Christ, you can know and experience God's love and plan for your life. People need to know Jesus didn't just die. He died for them. He died in our place. He died for you. Romans 5, 8 says, but God shows his love for us. And that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. That Jesus didn't just die. He rose from the grave. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 15, Christ died for our sins in accordance with the Scriptures. He was buried and He was raised on the third day in accordance with the Scriptures. And because Jesus died for our sins and He conquered those sins, Jesus is the only way for a person to be reconciled to the God who has a wonderful plan for their life. And Jesus says about this, he taught that I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me, John 14, 6. And there's a diagram to illustrate that as well. But we need to help people understand in all the thought processes and all the problems and all the things we see going on in the world, there's one answer for everybody, to know Jesus as Savior. It reminds me of a story about a father who really wanted to take a nap one afternoon. And he laid down on the couch, and if you've ever had little ones, you know uh, what happens. Little ones, are their purpose in life is to interrupt naps. That's what they do in, in a great way. So he, sit, he lays down on the couch, and all of a sudden, you've probably heard this, Daddy, 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 or Mama, 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 right? And, 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 and so he, he woke up, and, and he just, oh, man, right when he, he started to get to sleep, he got interrupted. And the little boy looked at him and said, Dad, I want to go outside and play. And he said, son, we'll go out and play. He said, but I want to take a nap, and I promise you, we'll go out and play after you do this. And he reached over on the coffee table, and there was a newspaper laying there, and there was a picture, a map of the world on that newspaper. And that father took that piece of uh, that pe that part of the newspaper and he tore it up in about a hundred different pieces, and he laid it out on the table and he mixed it all up and he said, "Son, if you can put this map of the world back together," he said, "after that we'll go outside and play." And so he thought, "Man, this, there's no way he'll be able to get all that back together." And so he kind of flipped over and let the little boy start working on on putting the the map back together. And sure enough, right about the time he got to sleep again, he heard, "Daddy." Daddy, 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 daddy. And he flipped over and he thought, there's no way he's got it together. And he looked over there on the table and the map of the world was put back together perfectly. And he looked at him and he said, son, how in the world did you do that? He said, daddy, it was simple. He said, on the other side of the picture of the world was a picture of a, a person. He said, and when I put the picture of the person back together, the world fit together just fine. And that's really the way it is with Jesus. Man, we've had a hard week. We've had a disturbing week. And I'll promise you this, there's probably a whole lot of different opinions around this room and on this broadcast of how we fix the entire problem. But I, I want you to understand this. As sad as it is what we see going on in our nation right now, please hear me when I say your purpose in life is not to fix this country. Your ultimate calling from God is not to save America. Our ultimate calling from God is to point people to Jesus. And if we would point people to Jesus, that would help them to see the world in a completely different way. That's the most important thing we can do, is to introduce people 
to their Creator who has a wonderful plan for their life. But it's not enough for people just to know that. They have to respond to that truth. And so spiritual law number four is this. We must place our faith in Jesus Christ as Savior in order to receive the gift of salvation and know God's wonderful plan for our lives. We have to begin the relationship. How does that work? People must receive Christ. John 1.12 says this, But to all who did receive Him, who believed in His name, He gave the right to become the children of God. We receive Jesus as Savior by faith. The Bible says in Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, For by grace you've been saved through faith. It's not of yourselves. It's a gift of God, not the result of works, lest anyone should boast. And whenever we receive Christ, He gives us a new birth. He gives us a, a new life. Not only do we have a physical body, but we become spiritually alive when the Holy Spirit of God comes inside of us. You're encouraged to read to a person, uh, John chapter 3, verses 1 through 8. And it really helps us understand why Jesus said what He did in John 3, 16. The reason He said what He did in John 3, 16 is because people must be born again. And so Jesus gives us an invitation. He doesn't force Himself on anyone. He is not just going to take over any person. But the book of Revelation says this, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in to him. And so we need to understand that we have to not only know the truth, but we have to receive it. We have to respond to it. We have to to make it the, the most important thing in our life. And if you can think about it like this. If you were to, to have a chair and, and the, the chair was the center of your life, whenever a person doesn't know Jesus, self is in that chair. Self determines everything else. But salvation means that I'm going to take myself out of that chair. And Christ is going to be the center of my life. Now, everything in my life is determined by what Christ wants me to do how He wants me to live, my relationship with Him. And so the question is this. This morning, if you don't know Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior, why would you not repent of sin and put your faith and trust in Him today? I want to encourage everyone in the room and everyone online just to bow your head for a moment. And what I'm about to give you is not a magic prayer. Saying these words saves no one. But you repenting of sin, believing in Jesus and receiving His gift of eternal life, Jesus is the one who saves. But I want to help you. I want to guide you. If you're like, man, I don't know what to do. I don't know what to say. I'm I'm going to throw you a life jacket. And you just begin to pray to Jesus right now. And the first thing you want to do is to confess your sin to Him. Jesus I know that I'm a sinner. I'm living my life for myself. Tell him about that. And then express to Christ that you want to repent. Lord Jesus, I don't want to live this way. I want to, I want to turn away from my sin. And I want to turn to you. Express your belief in him. I believe you are the son of God. I believe that you died for me. I believe that you rose from the grave. Ask Him to save you. Lord Jesus, would you please save me? Would you please put your Holy Spirit within me? Would you please make me spiritually alive? Express your commitment to Him. Lord Jesus, I want to follow you. Be your disciple. Now this morning... All I did is gave you a life jacket. I didn't explain to you how to follow Christ. I just explained to you how to come to Him. But this morning, if you prayed to receive Christ, if you're online, let us know. Just in a comment or an email. My email is brian at libertybaptistchurch.ws. If you're in this auditorium, there'll be people in the altar. You can just come and just tell them, hey, what next? What now? Now explain to me the life jacket. Now that I've got one, show me, show me what it means, how it's made, how to use it. We want to help you in that journey for the rest of your life to learn how to follow Jesus. 
Maybe there's things you need to pray about other than that. Maybe there's things going on in your family. Maybe you want to pray for our country. Maybe you want to pray for boldness in your witness. But Heavenly Father, we come before you this morning thanking you for the simple message of salvation. And we pray for people to be saved, for us to be bold, and for disciples to be made in the life of Liberty Baptist Church. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you stand together? Would you?